Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Chris. Uh, I come from old England. There it is. Brilliant. Thank you. I come from old England, uh, so I flew in on Tuesday, and I'm having an absolutely wonderful time here in Sarasota. You have an amazing city, so it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. So I'm going to share with you um, my own little story about how I have become very passionate about understanding what it is we can do to inspire children with a lifelong love of learning. Seems to me about the most important thing. It's the heart of the well-being of young people is that they wake up in the morning and they think, yes, I survived another night. <laughs> what am I going to discover today? And this is the mindset that I've been trying to understand from a sort of evolutionary point of view, but also from my own personal experience. And I want to start off by just uh, giving you a little bit of an anecdote as to how I got into this in the first place. I want to introduce you to um, Matilda, who is my uh, oldest daughter. There she is. Uh, this was 20 years ago. So <laughs> she, was, um, she was eight then. She's now 28. It's amazing how these things happen. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there she is, and she was very precocious, and she loved learning and reading, and every day there were exciting stories that she would discover in the world, and we just had the best time. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and then, at the age of eight, uh, when she was at school, she changed year groups, and an extraordinary thing started to happen, and after about three or four weeks, the old Matilda that we knew and loved seemed to have disappeared. She had checked out. Essentially... Um, she didn't want to go to school, uh, she didn't want to get up in the morning, she didn't want to get dressed. Um, uh, whose fault was it? It was our fault because we were the ones waking her up in the morning, asking her to get dressed, telling her to go to school. She stopped reading, she stopped asking questions, she started becoming moody. We thought, what on earth has happened and what has gone on with Matilda? And so, we went to see her teacher. Now, I think there are a few teachers in the audience here, from what I understand. It must be a nightmare for teachers when the parents come along and say, you know, what's my, ch my child uh, you know, has changed, doesn't want to come to school anymore. Now, at that time, at the age of eight, she, uh, the teacher was doing what teachers are meant to do in the system, which is make sure the kids pass the tests, particularly in reading and in maths. So um, the teacher looked down the test scores, and Matilda was quite good at reading, and she was quite good at maths, and she was doing just fine. So as far as the teacher was concerned, there was no problem with Matilda. But we knew there was a problem with Matilda, and we eventually, as I think back now uh, over all these years, I realized what the problem was. She had contracted a brain disease. And I say that in all honesty, and it's a disease that isn't that well recognized, although some of you may have experienced it yourself from time to time. It's commonly called boredom. Now. <laughs> Boredom is really a brain disease. You know, brains are not born bored. Can you imagine a kid born bored? You know, didn't want to come into the world in the first place, never asked to be here. <laughs> you know, what's going on? Why, where's, where's, where, where's my choice here? I, I don't want it. Don't like it, not interested. Okay, that's not the way the brain is born. The brain loves information. That is what it's there for. It loves information delivered through your eyes, your ears, your nose, your senses, your tongue. And it th thrives on processing new stuff. It needs change. If it doesn't get new stuff, it doesn't get change, it starts to shut down, like all the muscles in the body do if they're not used. And the beginning of that is boredom. And it becomes eventually something that is well recognized, thank goodness, these days, which is called depression. So I would say boredom is early onset depression. It's the beginning of a dysfunctional brain, brain disease. This is what was happening to Matilda. So we decided we needed to find another school. So we looked around near where we lived, and every school we visited said they were great at getting the kids through the tests. And that wasn't exactly what we wanted to hear, because we knew that teaching to the test wasn't something that was going to work for Matilda because she was bored. So um, we decided what we do is we will home educate now, I, I think there are a few home educators over here in the U.S. We have quite a lot in the U.K., and we thought, well, if we just home educate for a few weeks, how much damage can we do, right? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Uh, just while we find another school. So uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd uh, create a little schoolroom at home, and we get a curriculum, and we get a timetable, and we get one or two other people to come in and help us out on the areas we're not very good at, I go down to a sort of part-time work because I'm going to get into this and be a conscientious dad. And we have, a t we have a clock and we have a bell. And it's going to be amazing. You know, Matilda, in two months, she's going to 
she's going to do what it would take you two years to do in school. It would be absolutely phenomenal. Now, I'm going to show you a little picture of what happened in two months to the Lloyd household. It resembles the last scene of a play by an English playwright, you may have heard of, of this play. It's called Hamlet. And uh, <laughs> there we are. That is Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd after two months of home education. I tell you, it was unbelievable. This experience was unbelievable. We were so frustrated. She clearly didn't want to take any instruction. She didn't want to take it in school, and she, last thing of all, she wanted to take any instruction for us. Anything we felt she needed to know, she was not interested in. So, after two months, in our desperation, we sat her down and we said, Matilda, just tell us, what are you interested in? Right? Now, I think back and how arrogant it is that we never bothered to ask. They didn't ask at school. We didn't ask her parents. What are you interested in? We just spent all our time trying to tell her what we think she needed to know. But thank goodness she told us what she was interested in. And ever since then, it's changed all of our lives. I wouldn't be here today if she hadn't answered this question. I wouldn't be here today if in my frustration I hadn't, without thoughtfulness, asked the question, what are you interested in? And she said she was interested in penguins. <laughs> now, I kind of feel like I'm reliving my life here at Pink 23 when we hear about that amazing story of the Antarctic that Rob told us this morning. I'm sure there are some penguin lovers in the house. Of course, penguins are amazing. So she wants to find out. So we'll, we'll go to London Zoo. They have penguins. They're good penguins at the London Zoo, by the way. So we went to London Zoo, we had a brilliant day, she fed the penguins, we had a ray of sunshine in this great big life of gloom that had descended upon us, uh, and then she wants to try and find out where penguins come from. Well, where, where do penguins come from? Antarctica, good. I've subsequently found out there are quite a lot in South Africa as well, if you go there, on Boulders Bay or whatever it is, Boulders Beach, amazing. Um, so, yes, so she wants to find out about Antarctica. So she does a project, so I'm going to do a project about Antarctica, great, and she discovers to our amazement, I had no idea myself, that Antarctica used to be pretty close to the equator 250 million years ago when the world was, was, was a giant supercontinent and all the land masses had collided together. And ever since then, they've been splitting up like jigsaw puzzle pieces on the loose. And that explains volcanoes and, and, and tsunamis. And we learn about plate tectonics. And now, of course, Antarctica is down at the bottom of the world. And it's very, very cold. So how do the penguins survive in the cold? What do they do? This is, this is the sea bit in pink, by the way. <laughs> they huddle together, right? Community. And so they huddle together. So we learn about, you know, ways to survive in the cold and insulation. That's fantastic. And then I say to her, well, look, let, let, let's imagine there's a big group of penguins over here. And there's a little group of penguins over here. We're going to count out the penguins in each group. And now one penguin leaves that group and goes to that group. Uh, how many count penguins are there in each group? Now we start doing our arithmetic through penguins. By the way, you can do ratios. You can do percentages very easily. And then she taps me on the shoulder and she says, hey, Dad, why did the penguin leave that group and go to that group? And I'm thinking, well, what does it matter? Just do the math. <laughs> but she's not doing math. She's doing penguins. <laughs> so I uh, said, so, well, maybe it was bullied, or maybe it, maybe it fell in love. Let's be a bit more upbeat about this. And before I knew it, she'd gone off to her bedroom, and she was writing a story about why the penguin left the big group and went to the little group. And then, by the way, she wants to find out about ice, because we're in Antarctica. And it's really amazing, you know, because what happens with ice is you can heat it up. And you know what it turns into? It turns into? Water. Yeah, we say water where I come from, but anyway, I know what you mean. <laughs> anyway, yes, it turns into water. And then if you heat up the water, what happens? It disappears. I mean, isn't it amazing? It can rain in the morning, the sun comes out, and all the puddles just disappear. You know, and you can measure the temperatures of this. Now we're doing our science, okay? Measuring the temperatures of ice turns into water, and water just disappears. And she wants to find out about stories to do with ice. And so we find that there was this ship. You'll never believe it. It, it left Southampton in 1912, and they said it would never sink. So, this is a true story. True story, honestly. And they said it would never sink, so they didn't put enough lifeboats on board. 
okay? And we talk about arrogance, by the way. There's a lot of arrogance around, and we, we, we become very good at spotting arrogance. Uh, of course, in the context of a story, this really means something. And then there's the link with the iceberg, Ooh, with the ice, because, of course, on its first voyage, it strikes an iceberg. They said it would never sink. We talk about irony. Irony is an amazing thing uh, when you talk about it in the context of story and 1,529 people tragically lose their lives. So that was the link. And then she wants to do poems about penguins and then she wants to dance like a penguin. And I discovered to my utter amazement that all the skills you might want your eight-year-old child to be able to develop can be learned through penguins. <laughs> and they was going on. All because we asked her what she was interested in. And actually, of course, it isn't about learning through penguins. You can learn through anything. If you just connect knowledge together, right? We spend our lives, we've inherited this system where we split knowledge up into different subjects, and different curriculums, and different timetables, and different teachers, and different parts of the day. Now, I think about this thing. That's all I think about now, because this is really interesting, because there are lots of them out there in the audience, okay? And there's one of them here, and wouldn't it just behove us to sort of think a little bit about how this thing works? How does this thing really want to learn? What about this experience that I had with Matilda? Can I take and, and how can I sort of understand what's going on inside this in incredible organ, the human brain? The one thing I can promise you is the human brain thrives on making connections. It, it has to, it's the only way it, it knows how to learn. The synapses, the neurons, they make connections. It's very plastic. When you learn something new, it lays down some new connections. That makes a memory. When you remember something, it's, it's putting connections together so you can recall it. It is, a, it is all about connecting things together. If you don't connect things together, then, then the brain cannot function properly. If I, say to, if I go to a neurosurgeon and say, how does my brain work? Tell me about it. I promise you, he won't say, well, there's a little bit of chemistry here, and there's a little bit of history up here and the geography is over there and your, and, your, and, your, and your English language skills aren't looking very good, they're just here. You know, it is not divided up into different subjects. If you walk up and down the high street or if you go to Sarasota here, you don't find the city divided up into different subjects, do you? Because that is fiction, right? Dividing knowledge up into subjects is not really the way of the, the real world. That's not non-fiction, that is fiction. So I think we need to uh, rethink the way that we present knowledge and information and learning to young children, and we need to think a lot about how it works from a natural perspective. Over billions of years of evolution, our brains have evolved to learn through connections. What can we learn about that? Now, in COVID, I, uh, uh, since, um, uh, since sort of going on this journey myself uh, about learning, I've been publishing books that connect knowledge together, uh, which I will show you a little bit later on, and resources that try to create this sense of joy and, 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 and well-being in learning. Uh, one of the things I did in COVID was launch a kids magazine. Uh, it comes out every month, it's called What on Earth magazine, and it's all non-fiction, because I believe passionately that the real world is far more amazing than anything you can make up. If you have this mindset where there is no such thing as normal, there is no such thing as ordinary, these are things that happen to you because the system has not created an environment for curiosity to flow. Now, in this magazine, you'll find lots well, there's one, there's a magazine here in the November issue all about the brain, um, and there's lots of things about space, about nature, about history, about sport, but always at the back, we have a jokes page. And the reason we have a jokes page is because, for me, that demonstrates the power of making connections. So, I'm trying to give you a little insight into your own brains, that they love making connections. And when you make a connection, you might laugh. The other thing you might do is you might say this word, wow. And it actually happens in all countries of the world, I have discovered since I've been going on lecture tours and working with kids in different schools and teachers everywhere. It's the same, it's just human nature. And it's amazing, the same word is there. They go, wow, they go, wow in China, they go, wow in Japan. When you create the conditions for curiosity and for dopamine and the reward system to, to, to flow, which is what the brain naturally wants to do. So what I have here for you is five wows. I've been trying over the years to say, okay, what, what do we need to do in a classroom? What do we need to do at home? What do we need to do as parents? And even for ourselves to activate the brain to be the best it can possibly be and the optimize the brain as a learning system. And I've come up with five tips, okay? 
This is a mixture of science and experience and a little bit of psychology, and I just thought I'd share it with you because it might be useful. And every time I create a new educational resource, I'm always thinking about these five wows. Have I got these five wows embedded into the methodology of what I'm doing? Because then I can be sure that I'm creating something that's going to resonate with young people, that they will remember, that they will enjoy learning, and will feed their well-being and give them a purpose in life. The first one is to do with the big picture. Now, it's really interesting, when I was doing books on the history of the world, I've created books that connect knowledge together, not split them up, so I thought I'd try and write a book that goes from the beginning of time to the present day in a single volume. That was my first book. It was called What on Earth Happened, which is also quite an interesting question. Um, and it came out in 2008, and I was writing this book, and I discovered incredible things happening in the story of life, particularly when creatures first get eyesight. And it is thought the first creatures to get eyesight were probably trilobites about 530 million years ago in the sea. Before that, to find food, you had to be a sponge, and you had to sort of wave your little bits around and hope you got some food. Or you may be a worm, and you would sort of hope you stumbled across something. But trilobites had this amazing kind of uh, technology where they had uh, calcite uh, crystal eyes, and they could see. Now, this changes the rules of the game for everything, by the way. As soon as one creature can see, they're at a huge ad uh, advantage evolutionary because they can target their food. But also, if other creatures develop eyesight, they're also very vulnerable as well. And there's this thing called the Cambrian Explosion, where there's this kind of arms race, and they think it's to do with the fact that creatures got eyes and eyesight, and the rules of survival changed. Now, if you imagine, you have, if you have eyes, which you do, by the way, most people are able to see, then the key thing in the state of nature is to find something to eat. Uh, okay, so you need to hunt. Now, if you're hunting, it's a very precise, targeted... Uh, frame of mind you need to be in. You need to be in stealth mode to make sure that you're not heard by your potential predator, and you need to be very, very focused and concentrating on what you're doing in order to get your lunch, right? Which is what you're gonna get when I'm finished, I hope. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that requires a certain mindset, and that's often associated with the left side of the brain, by the way. Um, but if at the same time, and we have an eagle and a sparrow here, if that sparrow has flown the nest and it's spotted a little grain on the, on the beach, and it's working out how it's going to get fed because it's going to work out where the grain is compared with the pebbles, and it's going to coordinate its muscles to be able to get down to the little grain and eat it, etc., etc. If up above there's an eagle, and the eagle spots the sparrow and thinks, there's my lunch, the eagle swoops down, but as the eagle swoops down, it, the shadow of its wing passes over the little sparrow, and fortunately, the sparrow has another operating system. It has another sense of awareness which is not interested in the lunch at all. It's only interested in watching its back, the big picture. Because, of course, if that sparrow doesn't have a second way of experiencing the world, it will become the eagle's lunch, and it's over. So we have to have two ways of experiencing the world if we're going to survive in the state of nature with eyes all around us. And this is the big picture. And it is so often ignored, particularly in education systems. Everything's about detail. It's all about you know, maths and, and, and writing and solving problems. It's not about the big picture and putting things into context. And we're losing a whole lot of dopamine that flows when we see the big picture. And that's been programmed in right from the start, really, of when creatures had eyesight. If you take a child to the beach and they see this amazing landscape of, of, of sand and sea for the first time, what do they say? They say... Yeah, if you, take, if you show them the stars at night and they see all these incredible, beautiful lights in the sky, what do they say? Wow. You take them to the top of a mountain and you show them the incredible view beneath there, what do they say? Wow. You see, the dopamine requires the big picture, not just the intricate little details. So everything I try to do is to try to put things in context so that we can allow that understanding in our brains to flow through that appetite that we have to want to see the big picture. The second wow, this is to do with using our hands. Now, there are two brains here. One of them is the size of the brain that our ancestors had about three million years ago, an Australopithecus, and then that's compared with the size of our brains today. And the, 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 the ones three million years ago and our ancestors were about four times smaller. But there's very little genetically different between us and those ancestors, so why is there a huge difference in brain size? And there are lots of different scientific theories, but one of the ones that probably is most widely accepted is because our ancestor, whose nickname is Lucy, did an amazing thing. She got up and started walking on two feet. 
Why did she do that in the savannas of Africa three million years ago? There are at least 17 different theories that I've discovered as to uh, uh, trying to work out why that happened, but she did. And as a result, she had these things. And her and her descendants started to use their spare limbs, now they could walk upright, to do amazing things, like rub sticks together so they could make... Yeah. And they become very powerful creatures because they can scare away the wild animals, because they can, they can cook food, and they can uh, keep warm in the ice ages. And they use their hands for making tools and for weapons. And those creatures who made the best tools and the best weapons and the best hands are at an advantage over those who don't. So there's a selective pressure in favor of hand-to-eye coordination. To have good hand-to-eye coordination requires different circuits in the brain. Maybe that's a reason why our brains are much bigger than our ancestors. But look how important these things are. If you use your hands, you will get a shot of joy and dopamine. Now, I, I want to uh, quickly uh, uh, illustrate this. Uh, if you imagine that I have a, a very um, wonderful friend who I've known for many years. Uh, in, in fact, she's off the stage there. Her name's Crystal. Crystal, if you could just come this way. Very good. Give a round of applause to Crystal, please. There she is. Crystal. And uh, Crystal and I have known each other a very, very long time. Um, in fact, for a brief time, we were a bit of an item. Uh, but it didn't work out. Uh, but nevertheless, we stayed in close touch. It's Crystal's 25th birthday. Yeah, okay, she's happy with that. And to celebrate her birthday, I'm going to make her a beautiful little vase that you can put a flower in, okay? And I'm going to craft it, and I get the clay, and I'm going to put it on the wheel, and I'm going to craft it and shape it, and, and I'm going to put the water in, and I'm going to glaze it, and I'm going to color it, and, and under the bottom, I'm going to inscribe it to Crystal on the occasion of your special 25th birthday with love, Chris, right? And I'm going to give that to Crystal. There we go, Crystal. How do you feel, Crystal? Extravagant. You see, she, she's joy, full of joy at this very personal, bespoke present that I have given her because I've, I've used my hands. That is the point. Um, but if instead I was to give Crystal for her 25th birthday one of these, there you go, Crystal, doesn't have quite the same resonance, does it really? Functionally, it does exactly the same thing. You put a little flower on the top, there you go. Look what Chris gave me for my birthday, right? A little plastic bottle of water. water. But the difference is, of course, with the first one, I used my hands. Okay, thank you very much, Crystal. There we are. Happy birthday. So, there we are, using our hands. So, in everything we do, we've got to use our hands. You know, I can't give a talk without waving my hands around. And even if you like my talk, you might even put your hands together, correct? Because the dopamine flows. And that's why we do that, because it, it's just a function of our brains. It releases something that matters. Children who just sit in a chair all day long, listening to somebody, not using their hands or not learning, not using their brains. We are fundamentally visual creatures. This is the third wow. Do not think that words and numbers are very effective at telling stories. These are constructs that we've created in our society over the last few hundred thousand years, hundreds and, and a few thousand years for writing. They're not at all natural. And what our brains do is, if you read a page in a book, you know what your brain does? It turns it into something it understands. It turns it into an image. And it's called, in your imagination. That's why it's called an imagination. Because our brains are text-to-image converters. Now, I've just done a book called uh, the Encyclopedia Infographica. And the whole book is about demonstrating how lousy words and numbers are at telling really wonderful stories. Uh, and every spread is a story, is an infographic that behind it, there are words and numbers, but you couldn't tell the story in words and numbers. You have to visualize it. And I want to share with you this spread on page 32 and 33. This is the largest star in the universe. It's called UY Scuti, well, the largest star that we know of. It's about 9,500 light years away. It's in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And look at this incredibly big star, okay? Now, just to tell you the story, you might see a little dot there underneath it, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is our sun. Now, doesn't that tell you a story in an instant that you can understand the size, the extraordinary size of this star compared with our sun? You put that into numbers, and it doesn't mean anything. So it demonstrates the fact that we have to think visually when we're working with children and trying to give them uh, a joy of learning. The fourth wow uh, is discovery. You may recognize this guy, Archimedes. He was in the bath. He had to work out whether the king's crown was made of real gold or not. And he came up with his amazing theory as to how he was going to do that. And apparently leapt out of the bath and ran down the streets naked, shouting, Eureka, Eureka. That's the story. But discovery is really important. If you tell a child, 
I know something, you don't know it, and I'm going to test you. Do you think that's going to get the best out of them? It certainly isn't. Let's go back to the Stone Ages, when we were all nomads, wandering around in groups of 20 or 30. We're all different ages. You wouldn't ever have 30 children all the same age <laughs> wandering around together, that's for sure. All different ages, and let's say now you're moving from place to place. The most important thing to find is shelter, food, and water, so you can survive. And a child, age five or six, happens to, to chance upon a little spring with fresh water. So what do they do? They rush back to their group and they say, I found water. How do you think they're going to be considered? They're going to be considered a hero. Everybody's going to clap them. Everybody's going to say, that's fantastic, brilliant. We can settle here because we are pre-programmed to want to find out things other people don't know. So if you're home educating, or even better if you're a teacher, and your pupils find you, ask you something you don't know the answer, that is a great victory, right? Because you can ask the child to find out for themselves and then let everybody else know. And they can practice their research skills. And they can practice their communication skills. And we can all learn from each other because discovery is at the heart of giving children a sense of joy when they're learning. And finally, choice. We mustn't forget choice. You know, school in a traditional way, the children don't have choice. One of the students on the school, what's the favorite thing about today? Skipping school. Because they don't have choice. Now, we need choice. That's how the brain works. It needs trial and error in order to learn, so it needs choice. So, if you imagine going into a supermarket, we have something called Sainsbury's, you have something called Walmart, and if you go to Walmart, it only, let, imagine it only has three things for sale, right? Toilet paper, rice, and flour. Okay, useful, needed, but you don't go in there and say, wow, there's only three things for sale. There are 30,000 things for sale. Why? Because we love choice, and that makes us go, wow! Look at all of this choice. So when we are creating environments for children, we have to give them choice because at the heart of the whole idea here is to say, what are you interested in? Not, this is what you need to know. Okay, so those are my little tips for the five wows. What are you interested in, right? So at the heart of all schools should be the library because it's the one place that asks that question and children can find out what they're interested in. Angeline wanted to, she knew what she was interested in, but she didn't like school because they didn't give her a chance to explore that within the system. And look what she's become. Give her a round of applause again. I know she's still there. <laughs> Amazing. And I guess this is the point that really sort of rounds this off, is to say the arrogance of saying this is what you need to know is so profound. But how do we know what children are going to need to know in five minutes, let alone five years or 15 years? Because, of course, the world is changing so fast. There's only one thing you can be absolutely sure about. They need to have a love of learning. So they can find out for themselves. So they're going to want to be able to adapt as the world changes. And then they will do amazing things. And they will feel a sense of thrill and purpose in their lives. Because around every corner, there's a new story. There's a new discovery. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. That's the five wows. Thank you very much.